Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Bob Cadlick, the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services, and I want to thank you all for coming today to honor the memory and service of Deputy Assistant Secretary Edward J. Gabriel. Ed was a larger-than-life character, and the photos of Ed here, as large as they are, don't capture his true stature or impact on us all. He also had a heart as big as this room. It is only fitting that this room is being used with all those who came to remember Ed as a mentor, colleague, and friend. Today's event will not, not only allow us to remember Ed with tears and laughter, but honor his family who is here today, his wife, Patricia, his daughters, Elizabeth and Victoria, his twin brother, Elias, and he's a spitting image of Ed, and his wife, Harriet. We're also joined today by our Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Honorable Alex Azar, our Deputy Secretary, the Honorable Eric Hargan, the Honorable Mark Harvey, representing the White House, and the National Security Council, and the Associate Deputy of Health and Human Services, Mr. Charles Keckler. And all of you, and many of you who are watching this live, being streamed, are part of this ceremony. There is a hole in our hearts that will not be easily filled with Ed's passing. His memory will continue to live in all of us and this place by the example of his life that he had dedicated to his family and service not only to the Health and Human Services Department, the City of New York, but to this nation. I now ask you all to stand for the presentation of the colors by the United States Public Health Service Color Guard, followed by the singing of our national anthem by the U.S. Public Health Service Chorale. Post the colors. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the I would now ask Captain DeLay of the U.S. Public Health Service to come up and deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you today to honor the life of Edward Gabriel, a man who has, without falter, demonstrated the true meaning of service above self. Ed touched the lives of millions of people across the country and around the globe. 
most of whom have no idea to whom they owe a debt of gratitude. Father, your power brings us to birth. Your providence guides our lives, and by your command, we return to dust. We weep today at the loss of a man who selflessly dedicated his life to the service of others and who was filled with joy in the acts of his service. Father, we weep knowing that you weep with us and we are comforted. Today is a tough day and the next few minutes as we say our farewells will not be easy, but we choose to worship you and celebrate the life of this man whom you have called back into your presence. Father, light this service with your presence. Let your light shine upon our hearts that we may be able to give our last respects lovingly. Pour out your grace and your mercy on each one of us here today and bless those who are about to speak that they would have strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce the 24th Secretary of Health and Human Services, the Honorable Alex Azar. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. In particular, thank you, Pat, for joining us here to honor your husband, and thanks to the family for allowing us to have this memorial service here. As Dr. Cadlick said, today is a somber occasion, but let's remember that Ed would have wanted his memory to be a source of joy for all of us. Truly, the contributions that he made to this department and to the protection of his fellow Americans is a source of pride and joy for the Gabrielle family, Ed's colleagues, and everyone else present here today. One of the most moving memories that I have of Ed was from just over a year ago, the 17th anniversary of 9-11. As many of you know, on 9-11, Ed was serving as an assistant chief in the New York City Fire Department's EMS division and was on detail with the city's Office of Emergency Management. To commemorate the anniversary of that terrible day, he took me on a tour of the 9-11 exhibit at the National Museum of American History, just across the mall from HHS. He described being gathered with emergency personnel at the base of the South Tower before either tower had collapsed. It wasn't just emergency personnel. Right by Ed was the FDNY chaplain, Father Michael Judge, who had become a legendary minister to New Yorkers and New York firemen. Ed was sent around the corner of the tower to reach the mobile command center van that had just arrived, just as the tower began to collapse, killing many of those whom Ed had just been standing beside, including Father Judge and a number of firefighters and leaders of the FDNY. When we were over there at the memorial, there was a video on a recurring loop of that terrible morning, some of the documentary footage from that day. And I remember Ed looking up and saying, there I am, the green helmet. OK, I made it. And Ed always was joking. Those of you who know him well, always joking. But um, in addition to the joke, um, I could tell and we discussed just how seared, as for many of us who lived through that day and lost people that day, just um, that the moment of joy, of course, looking at the green helmet and seeing that he was safe but every time seeing that the memory of all of his comrades lost at that moment, that it, uh, it brought back to him. I could, I could hear and feel that in him. That day will remain etched in our country's collective memory as a day when we saw the very best, the truly exceptional and truly heroic from our country's first responders, especially the New York Fire and Police Departments. As President Bush once put it, on a day when buildings fell, heroes rose. One of the worst days in America's history saw some of the bravest acts in America's history. Ed served that day with great distinction, and he survived that day, while so many of his FDNY brothers and sisters did not. I know he took his survival as a gift. It gave him a sense of purpose, serving New York City up through 2005, continuing to build the city's preparedness for the next disaster. He was immensely proud of the work that he did in New York, and it was a great honor that Last fall, he gave me a commemorative pin, a miniature FDNY 9-11 badge, which I'm wearing today. On 9-11 this last year, 
I emailed Ed to tell him to keep an eye on the TV as the President and I were about to do a press conference from the Oval Office and I would be wearing his pin. Afterwards, he emailed me, I was just looking at the email again this morning, he emailed me saying that seeing that pin in the Oval Office with the President of the United States made many of his New York City police, fire, and EMS friends very happy and very proud. After Ed's work in New York, he went to work for the Walt Disney Corporation before returning to public service here at HHS. As many of you well know, Ed's always been a good natured jovial presence in the workplace and everywhere else. After working at Disney, when you asked him how his day was going, he was prone to respond that it was simply magical. I don't think I need to explain to anyone that a good-natured magical is not necessarily the typical response you get when you ask around a federal office building how people's days are going, <laughs> although we aspire to that. Who'd have thought that it would take a consummate New Yorker, and Ed was that, to make the office a much warmer and friendlier place? But that's how Ed was. Whether it was a quiet day, a stressful day, or a monumentally stressful day, he was incredibly good-natured in his outlook and effective in his work. I mean, just looking at Ed there, how can you not look up and just smile? I want to underscore how grateful the leadership of this department is to have had Ed serve here. He put in nearly four decades of public service in New York City protecting that city. He didn't know his country anything more, but he just kept giving. And here at HHS and elsewhere, his gift is a truly meaningful legacy. It's pretty hard for us here to match the reputation of Ed's first two employers, the New York City Fire Department and, of course, Disney. But I've seen the success that Ed and others built within ASPR, and that work deserves just as sterling a reputation as Disney and the FDNY. Ed helped save lives in his city on 9-11, and he helped save lives across America through his work here at HHS. But we don't have to describe his work just in the past tense. Every day, our country faces new emergencies and threats. As Dr. Cadlick likes to say, people who have the responsibility to respond to these threats sleep like babies, waking up every hour screaming and crying. <laughs> but we can all rest a bit easier because of the legacy that Ed left. We're safer because of the dedication that he had to New York City, to his department, and to his country. So thank you, Ed, for that gift. Thank you to the Gabriels for the years of supporting him in leaving that legacy of generosity and service. It will not be forgotten. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here to celebrate and be joyful about Ed's memory and allowing it to endure. Thank you. Ed had many titles in his career, paramedic, chief, deputy commissioner, or as they say, commish, director of global crisis management, principal deputy, and deputy assistant secretary. I first met Ed after 9-11 when he was deputy commissioner of preparedness office in the mayor's office for Mayor Bloomberg at that time. Our first encounter was brief as it occurred when I was assigned to the Homeland Security Council at the White House and I made a trip to the CDC in Atlanta, and coincidentally, Ed was there too. We were on two different agendas and schedules and simply exchanged greetings and business cards. But as fate would intervene, the very next day we ran each other at the Hartsfield Inter International Airport, where I'm convinced if you're going to heaven or hell, you have to transfer planes there. <laughs> I was going down the escalator and, and many of you have been there, right? So, you know, it's a busy place. So imagine as you're going up those four banks of escalators, there's two up and two down. I'm going up, uh, pardon me, I'm going down as he's going up. And he bail, belts out, hey, Cadillac, great to meet you. But when you get back to the White House, get your business cards redone. They spelt your name wrong. Well, you can imagine the reaction of the bystanders looking at Ed going up and me going down and wondering, who are these guys? 
But that was Ed, funny, exuberant, and playing to an audience. We ended up crossing paths over the years and found we had much in kind, common, kind of. Ed was from Brooklyn, and I was uh, born in Queens, and as I learned from him, that I was from the wrong side of the New York tracks. Ed had a long and distinguished career in the New York Fire Department, or the FDNY as it's called, and, I, and had I not joined the military, I would have ended up like, uh, like Ed and many of my high school chums who did the very same thing. Ed and I were both rabid Yankees fans, but could not agree when it came to football. We often de debated the relative greatness of his Jets and my Giants. And uh, Elias remind me today that it was a family thing. That they were all Giants fans. I mean, probably Jets fans, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. <laughs> But regardless of their respective records, we agreed the Jets and the Giants were always better than the Redskins. And this season, we both agreed that both of our teams stunk. Ed was first and foremost a first responder. And as it's described by the FDNY, Ed was on the job for over 26 years as one of the city's and the department's first licensed paramedics and remained on the job wherever he went. As a young paramedic, he met his wife, Pat, who I found out today, the real story, uh, who was at that time an ICU nurse. I had it incorrectly that she was an ER, ER nurse. And I had, was thinking, I was saying, God, I'd love to hear the story of how they first met, because I can only imagine with his personality, uh, Ed chatting up a charming, young, pretty ICU nurse after he delivered a patient to the hospital. And I also imagined, and I, and I got the full story, but I'm going to hold it for as a bit of mystery here, that uh, I would bet that Ed would find every possible way to find patients to deliver to the hospital, to the ICU, <laughs> just to see Patty when she was on duty. And that would be Ed working all the angles. Ed worked his way through the ranks to become a chief and serve, as you heard from our secretary, as one of the on-scene commanders at Ground Zero that fateful day of September 11th. He told me that story that was both riveting and miraculous. His survival just re reinforces the point that God wasn't done with him yet and hadn't called him. And he did so much more after that fateful day in the mayor's office at Disney, and here at HHS. But despite climbing the ladder of senior leadership in the city and federal government and the private sector, he never forgot his roots or being on the job, preparing to save lives. Ed's leadership style was management by walking around. He was ubiquitous in the halls of HHS, chatting up all those he would meet. How you doing? would be his opener, and he had time for anyone and everyone to meet, to meet new friends and catch up with old ones. He was a mentor to all and a person because who had experienced what he had, not only listened to others, but shared his own stories to remind us what can happen while on the job and having the watch. Ed's career took him from the streets of New York to the hallowed sea streets C-suites of America's Fortune 100 companies, Disney. An experience that gave him intimate insight into the global corporate leadership and business side of preparedness and crisis management. The sharpest rebuke I ever got from Ed was a comment that I made early in my tenure at Asper when I said, Ed, there's too much Mickey Mouse stuff here at HHS. He exploded. After a lecture about the importance of brands and the sanct sanctity of Mickey that was interspersed and punctuated with profanity, <laughs> I relearned an important warning that the Peanuts cartoonist Charles Schultz said, never discuss politics, religion, or the great pumpkin in polite company. And its corollary, never diss the mouse in front of Ed. <laughs> to Ed, relationships were everything and he worked hard to maintain them. In fact, we were talking about his list of contacts 
that are thousands, literally, of people he knew and he kept in touch with. But they were not only parts of Ed's inner core and values, but they're integral in how he would react to crises. During the harrowing days of Hurricane Irma and Maria, we deployed large numbers of our NDMS medical teams to Florida. Finding transportation and lodging during the height of two major hurricanes was an impossible task, but not for Ed. Ed literally picked up the phone, made a single call to his former colleagues at Disney, and immediately arranged lodging and food service for several hundred of our personnel at Disney World. They even arranged a morale visit by no one else than Mickey and Minnie Mouse. As Ed would routinely say and the secretary said, it was magical. But the relationships were Ed's magic. And since then, I have never since and will never will diss the mouse. It was also during that 2017 hurricane season that Ed had another close call. While visiting our deployed teams down in Texas during recovery operations after Hurricane Harvey, he developed an infection and experienced an episode of sepsis for which he was hospitalized in the intensive care unit. Ed was strong-willed and checked himself out against medical advice out of that Texas hospital to come home. That was Ed. He would not quit because he wasn't done, and God wasn't done with him and hadn't called him. He continued to work at Asper, quite frankly, when he didn't have to. Ed didn't need the creds or the coin. He achieved in his lifetime more than what five average people do collectively do in theirs. But he was driven. It was in his DNA that was tested and tempered on the, at the World Trade Center on 9-11. He continued to serve, to teach, and to remind us of all the costs of not being prepared. His life could be measured by the multiple titles he earned, lectures given, papers written, and committees served on, but it would fail to give a true measure to the man and all those who touched, he touched, taught, and loved, and no greater love than he had for his daughters, Elizabeth and Victoria. He would often share stories of their achievements, and one I remember very well was the pride he had in Elizabeth's award for her excellence in nursing. Elizabeth and Victoria, please know that your dad's greatest pride, achievement, and legacy were you, too. Of the things that would routinely happen in the middle of our senior staff meetings, this is hard for me, would be Ed's phone would ring, and the ringtone would be Stairway to Heaven. Sometimes I laughed. Sometimes I get miffed. I don't know who was calling him. Ed never answered it, and I found out from his wife that was a practice that he often followed. He didn't answer his phone calls, and he had multiple of them. It could have been his wife, it could have been his daughters, or it could have been his bookie, for that matter. And I don't ever want to know, because that tune will now and forever always remind me of Ed and his magic. But looking at it, back at it, Maybe it was God calling all those times. And one day, Ed finally picked it up. Ed ran the race. He gave it his all. And it's now our duty to be on the job and keep the watch. And we now have the watch. Ed reverently wore a lapel pin of the FDA, FDNY Maltese Cross emblazoned with the numbers 343 memorializing the number of his fellow fighter, firefighter colleagues and friends who perished on the day that he survived. Now he has finally and sadly joined their ranks. Now I hope that when I take the stairway or escalator up to heaven, and by the way, there are no guarantees because I am from Queens, <laughs> and hopefully get to St. Peter's Gate, I fully expect to hear from the other side of that wall in a booming voice, Hey, Cadillac, you're dead to me. <laughs> Farewell, Ed. Rest in peace, and we will miss you dearly. And thank you.
And now it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Sally Phillips to extend some personal reflections of Ed. Sally was one of Ed's closest colleagues and friends here at Asper, and we're grateful for all her service, particularly during this difficult time for the Gabriel family. Sally? Eddie Gabriel loved Dunkin' Donuts. He stopped every day, seven days a week, and if he missed a day, he was cranky. Eddie prided himself on buying nice suits and hand-picking dapper ties, but the minute he was off the clock, he donned a Yankees or an FDNY t-shirt, cargo shorts, winter, spring, summer, fall. Every time Disney released a movie, or when somebody stopped by and mentioned they're going to visit one of the theme parks for Disney, he thanked us profusely for adding to his pension and his stock value. <laughs> he loved everything Mickey, and you never dissed the mouse. If you ever drove in the car with him, you know Ed loved music. All kinds, from Pavarotti to show tunes, Music of the 50s, the 60s, the 80s, Eminem, but I could never get him to listen to country. His old TV interests were rather interesting and eclectic. The most fun to mention were Get Smart, Wonder Woman, Star Trek, and Emergency. He fancied himself still in love with Julie London to this day. And for movies, Mel Brooks was his BFF. Young Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, and Blazing Saddles were among his faves, of course, that totally fit his personality. Eddie was a 9-11 survivor and a New York first responder. He never felt comfortable with being called a hero. He respected and held that day in reverence for lost friends and often wondered why he was spared. We all know why. He had more work to do. He committed himself to ensuring that we never forget and that we learn from that event. His commitment was to ensure that people felt safe and that they were safe. And he put all of his energy, wisdom, and experience into that preparedness and response to that end. Eddie was always striving to grow his expertise and knowledge. He maintained that paramedic certification from 1978 and prided himself each year that he could still hit an IV with the first stick. And I'm sure the girls have heard that story a thousand times. To his core, heart and soul, Eddie was a first responder. He challenged himself to become a certified emergency manager when that new certification became available and maintained that through the years also. With the expanded role in business continuity at Disney, he became certified in business continuity. His portfolio of credentials and expertise, listed across the top, were constantly growing. But his greatest pride was that he had street creds, as he had done it all on the ground in real world events. Then, most recently, Ed decided to work on a doctorate. I used to be a university professor for 25 years, and Ed was the student from hell. He got all A's in all of his courses, but he wanted to get an A plus and 100%. This last semester, it should come as no surprise to you that he got that A plus in something like a 98 to a 99 point something percent and was still irritated at the one point per percent that he missed. Ed, as I was telling Bob this morning, had a phone directory larger than the Yellow Pages. Every time we got him a new phone, it took days to download his directory. Many of you were in there. He knew everyone personally in that list of hundreds of names, thousands of names. And when needed, he would pick up the phone, ask a favor, always get a yes, and then spend the rest of the call reminiscing on how some of the connections that they had made over the years. And he remembered them all. Everyone who has known Ed, worked with Ed, or just hung out with Ed was left with the feeling that they were his one special friend. He loved to talk and tell stories, some of which we really can't share here. You're going to hear about his professional successes and recognitions over his career today. 
He was a strong leader and mentor, knowledgeable, well-read with diverse interests in areas of business, finance, history, medicine, strategic leadership, and the like. And he was a good man, always respectful of others, and had a quick wit. If you were ever the brunt of his jokes, received a nickname, or got a prank call by his twin Elias, um, you were not alone. You will never forget those events. My friend Rachel Call remarked at his services last week, life just got a whole lot less interesting. And I know that heaven just got a whole lot more fun. Pat, Elizabeth, Victoria, Elias, Harriet, thank you for sharing him with us for just a little while. I'm so very sorry for your loss. Goodbye, my friend. I'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Gabrielle and Paul Ramirez from the Federal Bureau Investigation. Gabe. I'm going to try to keep it together because this is very hard. Um, Ed is well known at the FBI in a good way. <laughs> in a very good way. Uh, let me add that. He's in a very good way. Uh, he started working with the Bureau for his time in New York. Um, I met Ed uh, around five years ago in an interagency meeting. Um, very friendly, very ongoing. We became colleagues, friends, and developed that type of relationship that we can always count on each other. Um, I always get emails from Ed at any time, any day. Weekends were not off limits. Uh, he was very cryptic. Hey, do you know something about whatever the topic was? And uh, I got many of those, so I'm going to miss him very, very much. In the official side, we, the FBI and HHS, especially our friend Ed Gabriel, have something in common, the dedication to the mission of serving and protecting the American public. He was a walking institution who could always be relied upon without question when it came to the mission, whether it be through strategic planning, exercises, responding to national or man-made threats or incidents, and championing national policy. It really came through as a confident counselor and a good friend. I just had lunch with him last December before I went on vacation. He was always quick to joke, as I mean, a lot of people have mentioned, as well as being straightforward. He always tell me, you're wrong, and <laughs> always keeping mission success in mind. That was what you expect from a trusted colleague and a friend who only wanted to accomplish the mission, protect the American public, and see you succeed. Ed will be dearly missed for not only being a great public servant, he was, but also as a dedicated partner who always strove for a greater good and helping those around him succeed. Mahatma Gandhi one time says, there are no goodbyes for us. Wherever you are, you will always be in my heart. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Jan Daniel Gerard from the International Association, International Association of Emergency Medical Service Chiefs. Come on, Daniel. Thank you. Um. There's a certain energy in the room that I'd like to capture right now, um, and this will become apparent in a second. If everybody could just put your arms up for a second, just wave your arms back and forth. Everybody just do this for a second, please. Thank you. <laughs> I bet Elias $20 that I could get everybody to do the wave, so <laughs> I'll you catch up to me later, brother. Thank you. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Pat Elias, uh, the Assistant Secretary Cadillac, for allowing the International Association of EMS Chiefs the opportunity to share our memories of our dear brother, Ed Eddie. And we call him Eddie because everybody's Danny, and I'm from Newark, New Jersey, so, and it's Newark. Don't, don't try to tell me it's Newark. 
Hemingway once said, every man's life ends the same way. It's only the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguish one man from another. EMS is a dynamic atmosphere that forges relationships built on hardship, danger, and a brutish, horrific work environment that few people can understand. Eddie did. Eddie was what we wanted in every person we worked with. He was a good and decent man with a good heart. He was always at the ready. When anyone required aid, I never heard Eddie say, what do you want? Eddie always said, how can I help? There was something reassuring in that simple statement. The essence of it was pure elegance. He didn't view people as an inconvenience. He viewed this as an opportunity to help. That was the core of who Eddie is. He never wanted to see the public, his friends, or coworkers struggle. He was dedicated to the common good. Eddie wanted to share his knowledge with anyone who needed assistance. He was always reaching out to EMS leadership to see what was happening in our world. But most importantly, what could he do for us? When I worked North EMS, I remember Eddie was our point of contact for a hazmat training that New York, CMS was, uh, New York City EMS was conducting at Fort Cotton. He was working as the borough commander that day. Eddie met us and he took us inside the EMS Academy. And after he made introductions, just before he walked out, one of the EMTs asked, he said, hey, chief, any words of wisdom? And he stopped. He looked at the guy for a second. And he had that twinkle in his eye, and I didn't know what he was going to say. But he said something that was pretty profound. He said, the most important thing to remember is it doesn't make a difference what the incident is. Always take care of each other. I carry that with me to this day. My final words to every class we graduate at our academy are always Eddie's. Remember one thing, always take care of each other. Regardless of where Eddie was working, it could have been Bravo Ambulance, Disney, Health and Human Services, there was always something he wanted to share with us. When Eddie first came over to work in the Asper, he couldn't wait to tell us at the, at the Chiefs Association, all of the incredible work that went on here, what services were available to us and how we could work together, but most importantly, how he could help us. When he would come and speak at our annual leadership summit, whether it was about Tracy or Barda or one of the many disasters that the brave men and women of the Asper have to respond to and stand up for, he spoke of the men and women here with such high esteem, he held him in such high regard, it was truly inspiring. His chest would puff out. He was so incredibly proud of what they accomplished at the Asper, it made us proud too, because Eddie was one of us. And to see him in a leadership role made us all proud and made us all stand tall. Our time is not our own. Our time with Eddie was so short, but every minute was exceptional. We keep Eddie's spirit alive when we do the things we loved most about him. There is one stanza from an E.E. E. Cummings poem, I carry your heart with me, and I think that it's apropos here. Here's the deepest secret nobody knows. Here's the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. Husband, father, brother, partner, boss, but most importantly, friend. Words cannot begin to describe who Eddie is and what he meant to us. Eddie is electric now. He is forever locked into our collective minds. And even though he has left us, in his heart, he will carry our love and hope for him for eternity. Eddie, we will remember you always as a good person, someone who is always ready to help. Your brothers and sisters from EMS will forever carry you in our hearts with love, honor, and respect. Again, I want to thank Sally, Gabe, and Danny uh, for your heartfelt remarks. 
And now we would like to recognize Ed's invaluable contributions to HHS. And we have the opportunity to now to award him posthumously the Investor in People Leadership Award to Edward J. Gabriel for esteemed recognition of his leadership, dedication to duty, and remarkable nine-year federal service to the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and the Department of Health and Human Services. To present this award to Ed's family and to his wife, Pat, is Deputy Secretary Hargan. And now, Secretary Azar will present the flag of the United States of America that was flown in honor of Eddie over the Capitol. I would ask you to please stand and for the family to remain seated. That was kind of a Simon Says thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Azar. Please be seated. I now invite the Gabriel family to make remarks. I should have asked to go first. <laughs> it would have been easier. When I think of Ed, I think funny, calm under pressure, mischievous, smart, dedicated, compassionate, committed to the world of emergency management, strong, loving, my rock. I met Ed when we were both volunteering at our local ambulance service. It's hard to believe that that was 41 years ago and that I wouldn't go out with him the first two times he asked. <laughs> what I would have missed if I didn't say yes the third time. We are truly blessed. We loved each other. We were best friends, each other's rock. We both worked in fields where we saw every day the fragile nature of life, understood that it could be taken at a moment's notice. And we used that knowledge to reinforce our commitment to each other. Our rule was simple, never go to sleep without making up and always say I love you when you got up in the morning. His professional accomplishments were many. 
We saw her move through the ranks of FDNY, the move to the mayor's office, Disney, the most magical place, and finally here at HHS. He left his mark everywhere. The training of EMTs and medics, emergency response plans and protocols, disaster response and control, whether it be at an airplane crash, a fire with a building collapse, the World Trade Center, he did what was needed to control the situation, keep civilians and staff safe, and have the best outcome. At Disney, he was privileged to travel the world to help develop appropriate emergency management planning and exercises. And then he chose to come here to the federal government so that he could take his knowledge and experience from both the city government and the private sector and use it to help our nation on a broader scale. We are so proud of his work. But to me, he was just my honey, or dad to our girls. He was so proud of us and our accomplishments in our lives. He loved us, he cared for us, he provided for us, he entertained us with his sense of humor, he supported us when we needed to lean on his strength. He is chief, boss, commissioner, deputy secretary to all of you, but at home he was just my honey, the girl's dad, and he was loved and we were loved in return. The past two weeks have been overwhelming for us. The respect, the care, the love of those who have met him has been very clear. I wish we could remember every single story told to us about some interactions each of you had with Ed. We've been surrounded with love and care from our families, our friends, Bravo, FDNY, Disney, HHS, and for us, our bubble of love from our suburban work family. And we will never be able to express our gratitude for that support and love. Ed's legacy will be through you. Just take one thing that he taught you or that you admired about him and build it into your life. Make it better and you honor him and make the world a better place. Thank you is such simple words, but they're all that we have. Thank you for caring. Thank you for showing respect for his work and for our loss. Thank you for sharing your stories with us and thank you for this wonderful memorial to my honey. Thank you, Pat. Captain DeLay will now give us the benediction. Our most gracious God and Father, we thank you for your presence and love which helps us to endure through difficult times. We thank you for moments like these when we don't have to be alone, but can gather together to support one another and to celebrate together a life of service. We thank you for the peace that you give us, your peace that can exist within us. As much as you comfort us who have gathered here today, we pray that in an even greater measure, you will comfort the family and loved ones of Edward Gabriel. Be for them all that they need you to be just now and continue to provide for them in every way in the days and years ahead as they face life without your servant whom you have called home. Go with us now, Lord, we pray, as we continue to celebrate the life of a truly great and humble man, that we would aspire to serve others as Ed has shown us how to do let us honor his life by continuing the joyful, 
the selfless, the magical service he demonstrated every day of his life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for, he for being here today and showing their support and paying respects to the Gabriel family. In honor of Ed, and I know Ed would particularly like this, uh, I have authorized that all ASPR personnel will take the rest of the day off. Um, it doesn't come, out, co doesn't come without a caveat and a charge. We heard the charge from his wife. I think it's an opportunity to go home, spend time with your families and friends, and share them the story of a great man and that thing that we're going to take forward from his life that will make not only us a better person, but the world a better place. I'm sure Ed would be somewhat overwhelmed and embarrassed by today's pomp and circumstance, uh, but I think he would also have been incredibly humbled. Uh, and I would just offer to you that he would probably say one other thing, which would have been, Forget about it. I do have one ask of you uh, as we now uh, prepare to end this ceremony is I'll ask that you please stay standing while the Gabriel family and the official party exits. Thank you.